black. It looks the best. Uh, it looks the best when it's clean and polished. Exactly. Well, I got a saying for that. Black's not a color, it's a full-time job. <laughs> it is a full-time job. We're flying. You see that? I came in, I went out, woo! Um, <laughs> yes, we are back again, and we have Anthony. Thank you. Everybody say hi to Anthony. Clap out there. Boys down in the comments. Um, I see you have a smorgasbord of stuff, and I hear that you've been dealing with Mike and everything on your little project car, and you guys heard this thing coming in? Oh my God, it's, there's, a little, there's a little something underneath the hood. It's not your ordinary old man Cadillac. It's no. definitely a, a little souped up, don't yeah, you think? just a little bit. Um, but what we're gonna do today, Mike, what are we doing today? Uh, you know, we're gonna go over how to address soft paint. Some people would uh, refer to it as finicky paint, and then the problems with micro-marring when you do have softer or finicky paint. And what's the secret behind that? Uh, doing a test spot. And you did how many test spots on this car? I've done a lot of test spots. It took me a little bit to, uh, still trying to figure it out. Well, that, <laughs> that, that's something that you learned during the class, correct? Because yeah, he, he attended one of your classes, how he long? Did. So that you, you took that away. So which everybody out there, if you take anything away from this video, the power of a test spot, right? That's right, test spot. All right, so what we are going to do, he's going to show you what he did. He's going to instruct him on how to do it. I'm going to go back there. I'm going to fly behind the camera. And like always, if you have co uh, questions, comments, or anything that you would like to see answered, post it down in the comments down below. And I'm turning it over to you, and I'm going to go fly. <laughs> fly! Okay. <laughs> hey, well, Anthony, uh, thank you, first of all, for bringing your car all the way down from Melbourne, Florida, yep. to Stewart, Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, and I tell you, it, this thing does sound good. You got a cam in here, is that? Yes. Cause man, it, it's uh, bumpy. It's got a bumpy lope to it, you know. And it sounds good. And your exhaust sounds good. This, like Yancey says, this is not your dad's Cadillac. That's true. So, but we need to make the paint look as good as it sounds. Well, yeah. from here it looks good. Yeah, yeah you got It's all about <laughs> from, the good from light. ten feet away. It looks good. Yeah, you know, I posted a quick video to my Facebook page and my Instagram page uh, when we had direct sunlight, and man, this thing did not look good. No, it doesn't. So come up here and let's just start with this. Why don't you kind of walk me through, and you, you did the right thing, you did a test spot, mm -hmm. and then you did four of them back here, yes. and you were trying to dial in the right process, exactly. but let's just kind of walk through and show me what you did first, and uh, I'll grab a swirl finder light and kind of let Yancey take a look at you know what we're seeing with the swirl finder light. All right, I, I'm, I'm here, man, I'm here. Okay. Where's your light, man? It's hiding behind a bottle of Sonax. Right. Okay, so this first one, this looks not good. No. Not good. Do you remember what you used on that one? Yeah. Um, when I was first doing this, you know, I was being told and I tried to do some research that it was a really hard clear coat, so I ended up making a mistake by kind of go, you're supposed to, you know, go less aggressive and work up. I did the opposite. Yes. Uh, I ended up using <laughs> a rotary on here with some cut max. Okay. And a 50-50 Eurofiber. So the cut max mm -hmm. he's talking about, this is a new product from Sonax, and the way Sonax goes to market is they've got a, a, a scale. They actually got a two row uh, scale of different bars here. And the top scale shows the cut and the bottom scale will show the finish. And this has a cut of six plus. So this goes off the scale. Uh, my good friend Rob told me they thought about putting a seven on there, but you know they've, they've uh, done such a good job of branding the, the one to six numbers that they mm -hmm. didn't want to do that. So they actually put a six plus. And that's your sign that this is aggressive. Now, just yeah. by chance, I used this the other day ago um, on a car that had horrendous love bug etchings. And I used kind of a normal compound and it did a good job. And then I hit one half the hood with this and it pretty much eliminated all the etchings. And uh, not that you can always remove 100% of the love bug etchings on the front of a car, but it, it peeled enough clear away that they just disappear. So I could tell right away, this was some aggressive cutting compound. Mm -hmm. So you started with this. Yes. Okay. And put the pad up there too, if you could. I could do that. Okay. Or you could just put the pad up there. You can leave the chemical over there. Okay. The so, and around. then you use the microfiber pad. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So one of the things that's important to remember, and I'm telling this to people all the time, fibers Fibers are abrasives. They're a form of abrasive. They're more aggressive than foam because you've got all these individual fingers mm -hmm. grinding or cutting against the paint, making their own cut. It's more aggressive. Foam, on the other hand, let me just grab a foam pad to show you. Foam has a uniform texture, so it's, it's the complete opposite of all the different fingers of a fiber pad. So foam, because it's got a uniform texture, will always tend to be less aggressive than any brand or any type of fiber pad due to the individual fibers. Gotcha. 
Okay, so you cut that with a cut mm -hmm. max and a fiber, and I'll tell you one thing, I'll guarantee he removed all the swirls and scratches. There was some deep <laughs> ones in here as well, yeah. so I mean. So all the defects are gone, but it just doesn't look good. Yeah. Okay, so then what did you do for this next spot? Okay, so this is where. Yeah, give me some light on there. Um, move the back towards you, back, 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 uh, towards the TV, towards the TV, towards the TV, there you go, right there. All right, go ahead and move it around a little bit. Okay, so that's your basic micro marring with mm -hmm. a DA. I can tell by the pattern. Yes, I got rid of the Cut Max. I realized it was way too <laughs> aggressive, obviously. I went to the Sonax 0406. Okay. And I put on a, like a heavier foam pad. Okay, so here's the product to use. The Sonax makes great abrasive technology. Anybody that's been reading my articles, watching my videos, even when I was on TV, I talked about abrasive technology all the time. And the, what I tell guys is, a lot of guys that are detailers, they tend to be what I would describe as an alpha male, you know, kind of a... No! Yeah, you know, kind of a, you know, it's really about the ego. I am so good. Oh, goodness you know? gracious. But it's not about you, because you aren't touching the paint. It's the product first, then the pad, then the tool, then you. You're the furthest thing away. Of course, technique's important, but you're the furthest thing away from the surface of the paint. Sonix makes great stuff, but even this here, if you look at the numbers here, this is the EX0406. It starts out with a cut of four, finishes out at a six. And I always kind of tell people one way to think of this would just be a that. medium cut okay. polish, okay? So it's a great polish that finishes out good, but you know what? It was still too aggressive there for a soft paint. All right, okay? there you go. Normal paint's not a problem. Okay, so then, so then, and what pad did you use on this? This was the heavy foam pad. Heavy foam pad, a heavy so cutting foam cut, pad? Yes, sir. Do you have that in your arsenal somewhere? Somewhere I do. Go grab it. Go I have it. a little bit of everything here. Okay, then while you're grabbing that, um, let's take a look at his third test spot. All right, hold on. Let me zoom in. Uh, you're going to have to move it back towards the... TV? Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, it's the... All right, you, you're almost there. Keep going. You're kidding me. No, it's just the angle. To get it here? Yeah. Okay. All right, now, hold on. I can't, there's what we're talking about right there. Hey, micro marring. Micro marring. Okay, so then this is a closed cell foam cutting pad. Okay, so that's correct, right? The blue is cutting. Mm -hmm. And it's still not very sharp, but on soft paint, you know, that's a huge game changer, the type of foam that you're using. So you're using kind of a medium cut polish with a, uh, not too aggressive, but a, a foam cutting pad, mm -hmm. and it's leaving the micro mark. So then what did you use on this test spot? Okay, so that was also the 0406. Okay, the 0406. Yes, and I think we used a polishing, a not a finishing, yeah. but it was a, still a, a polishing. Not polishing quite pad. as, uh, not as aggressive not as, as, that as aggressive. One. As that okay, one. and we still ended up with micro mark. And then when we get to this last one here, yeah. what did you use for this one? So that ended up being almost like a, a two-step process where we did the 50-50 with the 0406, but then You're I came back with a... Come, no, just bring it down. Yeah. Uh, all right, now um, go that way. Go that way. Yeah, it ain't going to get there. It's the angle, <laughs> the angle of the, the hood is... Gotcha. Sure. Okay, well, here's the big picture. When we look at this, this looks mm -hmm. pretty good. Yes. It's not perfect, but it does look pretty good. Yeah. So... What we did is we took a look at the products he had, and he's got great abrasive technology, but he's dealing with really soft paint. And like, you guys can talk. I'm just so this is where you need an even less aggressive product. You're, you're finishing out with a soft foam finishing pad. You can't get too much softer. Let me show you the pad. Here's the pad you're finishing out with. Yes. This is just your basic black you know, foam finishing pad. I don't know what brand this is, but it's just your basic, you know, it's soft. It's soft enough I would put makeup on it's that soft, you know, so. <laughs> and he does, people. <laughs> uh, so you switch to the soft pad, and you can continue to use the EX04, mm -hmm. and it looks good. I mean, yeah. most people look at that and go, damn, that looks good. I just did But you're, <laughs> you're a detailer, and this is a black car, and you want to showcase your skills and talents for mm -hmm. your business on this car. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the next variable that you could change is get an even less aggressive product. Now, I know that when you're just starting out, you don't have an unlimited budget. Yeah. So you bought two great products, mm -hmm. 
but there's a third one you could have bought. Could have. <laughs> and that's, that's this nano polish from Sonax, okay? So now according to their cut scale, this has a cut of three, so we're dropping down on the cut side and a gloss of six, but it's still a much less aggressive product than the two that you already had. And we've already tested this on the hood, perfect results, correct? That's correct. Okay, so, so the big picture is this. Whenever you're detailing a car, after you've done the basic steps of washing and clean, the next thing you're gonna do is your test spot. And normally, when you do a test spot, you always wanna test the least aggressive product to get the job done. And when I say get the job done, of course, that means to remove the defects to your satisfaction mm -hmm. while leaving the most paint on the car. Most of the time when people talk about test spots, they leave that last part out. Use the least aggressive product to get the job done. Get the job done means get the defects and then the part they leave out while leaving the most paint on the car. That's the thing that ties yeah. the whole thing together. Otherwise just, otherwise, just compound everything, you know? Anyway, um, I coined the term test spot in this industry. Oh, here, let me, I got something for that. <laughs> and, and, and at least the oldest reference to it dates back to the year 2004. All right, here we go, people. I am putting it up. Here is, well, the earliest, I have it up on the screen because you can't see it. Yeah. The first photo of documented test spot, 1999. Yes, 1999. Right. Now, we're going to go to first documented article. If you can read this right here, 3-4-2004 at 10.32 a.m. <laughs> so you were up early in the morning. Okay, so I was on the autopia.org discussion forum helping this person figure out what went wrong, and that's where I was explaining to him this thing that I always did in my detailing practice called the test spot. And now it's kind of a universal term used throughout the detailing industry, and it's an important term and everybody's got to learn what it is and how to use it. And it starts with testing the least aggressive product to get the job done. Now, the next thing that comes up when you're detailing a car is people want to know, is my paint hard or soft? And um, I actually cover that in my how-to book. Uh, Getsy, could you run over and grab a copy off the stage? Um, I'm running. And, and people never like the answer. I answer the question, but people don't like the answer. The answer to how do you know if a paint is hard or soft is you do a test spot. <laughs> and, and you have to draw from experience. So if you're brand new at detailing cars, you have no experience. So it's really hard to gauge if a paint is soft, hard or soft if you've never buffed out a car. So that's why I tell people, you know, every time you buff out a car and you're starting out, you know, at some point, here's where it's, uh, I'll look up the page number, it's in there, but it's in here, I answer the question, how to tell if a paint is hard or soft. But at some point, you, you've started out going down the Sonax line, so you've got a bunch of their products. I'm going to give you this, by the way, to take home to finish out the car. Oh, thank you. We're just going to do the, the hood today. Because uh, Mike is? Lazy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you also have a combination of pads mm -hmm. and also the tools that you're going to be using for your business. And out of these pads, products, and tool, you know, as you're buffing out cars, you, you need to, every time you work in a car, to lock in, okay, what did I get for a result with that polish and that pad? Mm -hmm. What did I get with that polish and that pad? You know, kind of lock it in. And that's not going to help you until you work on that exact same car, assuming it has the same paint, but it starts to develop a baseline for you to gauge the next cars you worked on. So say you took a, a foam polishing pad and a light cut polish to this car, say you would have done it the first time and you found out it corrected it, you could have actually said to yourself, wow, this paint's pretty soft. Yeah. You know, I, could, I corrected it, I pulled all the swirls and scratches out with a fine cut polish and a finishing pad. You know, and, and eight normal section passes with the free spinning DA polisher, that to me would be a fairly soft paint. Now, if you worked all the way up to the cut max with, mm -hmm. the, with the microfiber pad and you're still not pulling the swirls and scratches out, then you can start to think, hey, this must be a pretty hard paint because I'm really going at it and I'm not getting the defect removal I'm looking for. But that's the only way to learn hard and soft paint is A, buff out a lot of cars, B, remember the results from all the testing you did and what you finally determined that you're gonna use on that paint system. That all comes into experience, getting in the trenches and doing the job. And, and that's what it says in the book, it comes down to experience. See, what everybody wants is everybody wants a diagram. Okay, here's a list of all the car manufacturers and all the cars, and here's a little X that'll mm -hmm. mark what the paint is. And A, that's never gonna happen. I don't get the time <laughs> to make that chart, and I've never met anybody else that has that kind of time. And B, paints are always changing. Okay, so. Could uh, be repainted too. It could be repainted also, but on the assembly line, you know, everything's evolving. In fact, the phone that you probably bought this last year is probably already obsolete. 
Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> same thing for laptops and same thing for cars. Everything's yeah. always evolving, getting better, faster, stronger, okay? Well, paint systems are evolving and, and paint companies that uh, manufacture for the OEM, you know, they're, they're, they have a lot of things that they're trying to do. One is trying to meet a stringent um, VOC laws, but also trying to cut costs, uh, have better paints. That we wish they were making paints that were user friendly, but yet that's usually not a criteria. You know, it's usually cost and and, and speed, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the EPA. But because paints are all changing, you cannot just say, "Well, all Corvettes have hard paint." I recently detailed a brand new C8 uh, rear engine Corvette. And all the Corvettes I've worked on from C4 up to C7, I would say they had hard paint. I worked on the C8, I would say it had medium to soft. It certainly didn't have hard paint. So it's really a bad idea to make a blanket statement and said, do a test spot. Okay. Yeah, the power of the test spot, right? That's Let me look over my notes, what else? Okay, so then the other thing you wanna do, if you really wanna dial in and make sure the test spot is proving that your system is working, is you can go ahead and chemically strip the test spot. So for that, you could use a panel wipe uh, you could use glass cleaner. You could use a car wash soap if you wanted to wash the car. All right, question on that. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to hijack you, but you, before I lose my train of thought, uh, I know a lot of people out there, they'll use like an all-in-one that has some sort of a protectant or a wax. Would you, when you're doing a test spot, you would want to strip that to make sure that you're doing your entire process you correctly, if, right? Because if yep. not, that could hide some of the micro That's or, true. Now, and let me go deep on that. I hate to go deep. Let's go deep. All right, here we okay. go. You got, you got your scuba gear? <laughs> so, so some guys would say a, an AIO or a, a cleaner wax or a cleaner seal, something that cleans and protects in one step will mask the defects. Of course it will. Mm -hmm. It has a protection component. You know, a lot of people say, well, what'd you do this weekend? Well, I put a coat of wax on my car. Or I put a layer of wax on my car. If you're putting a layer over anything and there's swirls and scratches, it's gonna mm -hmm. coat over and fill them in. That's its job. In fact, if a wax doesn't coat over and leave itself behind, it's not, doing it's not working. <laughs> so of course an AIO is gonna mask defects. So if you're using anybody's AIO, you wanna make 100% sure that it's actually removing the, de the defects to your satisfaction and not just hiding them, then go ahead and chemically strip your test spot when you use an AIO. Uh, but yeah, uh, any, but anytime you're doing this, if you wanna make 100% sure, you wanna chemically strip, and then you know it's always nice to have a good handheld light to inspect the results. Um, you could also use sunlight, but that means A, it's gotta be around noon, B, it's gotta be in the summer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so if you're in the middle of winter and it's snowing outside, it's gonna be pretty hard to use the sun to inspect your results. So uh, as, a, as a professional detailer, you should always have a, a good handheld light that you can use to not only inspect four defects before you start, mm -hmm. four defects when you're doing the, uh, the test spot, but also when you go to uh, install a coating or even a wax to look for smudges or high spots. There's so many uh, handy uses for this. In fact, we'll be shooting a video in the future called um, uh, the How to Get a New Customer Care Kit. One yes, of the that is going to be a good one. Yeah, it's, it's the, the topic is how to get a new customer, the things you need, and one of them is a good scroll finder light. That's right. Okay, so now that we've, did, now that we've, you and I have determined through some testing up front that this paint is in fact on the soft side, yes. and you've already done these four test spots, mm -hmm. what we need to do is just go ahead and remove the micro marring in each one of the test spots, yep. you know, to, to fix this paint so it would be ready to coat. I say you tackle the hardest one first. I want to see that just yeah. get totally black. Uh, and um, uh, in, in order to do this, uh, first I just want to talk to you, what, what, normal is your, what is your normal tool of choice when you polish paint? Uh, right now, since I'm, you know, budget, <laughs> we yeah. have the uh, Torque 15. Uh, it's a 15 millimeter throw. Got it. Okay. That's what I've been using for this. Okay. Nothing wrong with this tool. We used to sell these here at AutoGeek. Um, I'm not sure why we don't any longer, but the tool works. Okay. So what he's talking about is this is a 15 millimeter free spinning random orbital mm -hmm. polisher. And this one's kind of unique in the industry. And then instead of having a dial, it has an on off switch and then it has a digital speed control with the digital readouts. Yes. Kind of cool. Okay. Now this has about a five inch backing plate. I'll let you take this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, flying in. and then one of the things that me and Anthony had talked about was the different pads. And so I brought some base, some of your basic pads. Ooh, Look. your clean, dirty towels about got you. <laughs> about got me. Uh, uh, recently, I saw some people talking about pads. Here, why don't you bring them over to the trunk so that way sure. we get you all in. Okay, so th this here is, uh, when, when we did our testing up front, mm -hmm. one of the things I told you is whenever I do 
testing on paint to try to figure out what I have going on with the paint itself is I reduce all the factors to the most simplest things I can. So for a pad, I just want a foam pad with a flat surface. I don't want a design. I don't want a diamond design. I don't want little holes. I don't want nothing in there. I want to reduce any potential for something that could alter my testing. And by having a completely flat surface, the pad will not be altering or adding any of its own uniqueness to the testing. Mm -hmm. So we did all our testing with your basic. This is a Lake Country white five and a half inch flat face foam polishing pad. You cannot get any more simple than this basic pad. Now, uh, where was I going with that? And then for the tool, this is the old standby. This is your basic Porter cable tool. I always tell people millions of cars have been <laughs> de-swirled with this simple tool. So whenever I'm doing testing, instead of using a 21 or a gear driven or anything, I keep everything I can as simple as I can. So I used a Porter cable, a flat foam face polishing pad, and then unlike what you did, I went ahead and switched to a fine cut finishing polish. And the results we got were spot well, this kind of goes along with the lines. I mean, he had everything. He had a compound, he had a polish, but there's always the right tool for the right job. And that's exactly what this is. And tended. the right product. So yeah. he well, was, that, yeah. I'm using product as a tool, but. Yeah, so you were close, you just didn't want a product. So anyway, so tell you what, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna give you. Um, it's you get to go to school now. <laughs> When it comes to removing, you know, this level mm -hmm. of marring in because the paint here, these swirls. You can remove that tape, Mike. I just yeah. had it on there so that way we could separate it out gotcha. for the video. When it comes to removing this level of marring, what it, even on a soft paint, if it's fairly deep, it might take a more aggressive pad. We don't know. So tell you what, let's just test the soft foam finishing pad. Okay. If it doesn't work, we can always come back with just a little, we'll keep the product the same but we'll use a little bit more aggressive pad. All right, how about you two swap sides? That way he has where he can set the product oh, and stuff right. down on the side. There you go. There <laughs> you go. Okay. Now, one of the things I teach in all my classes that we've covered here on a bunch of our live classes is counting out your section passes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a lot of people know I'm not a three P-sized drop guy. Okay, there's three P-size drop. That is not enough product to buff out a car. You need a certain it's amount. a matchbox it is. A you know, matchbox car. <laughs> you need a certain amount of lubrication on the surface and a certain amount of abrasives which are embodied in the product itself. So. <laughs> glug, 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 glug. There you go. <laughs> that looks like enough product to buff out. Let's just go ahead and do from here and say a little, about an inch away from the tape so you don't uh -huh. pull any residue over. And I'll let you go ahead and let's see your stuff, man. Cord All over right. shoulder. Yes, you sir. got it. All right. Hey, count out your section passes after you get your product spread out. Yeah. Okay. And then one of the things we talked about is you probably weren't using the highest speed, were you? I was not. And when I went and I did the testing, I went all the way to the max. Yeah. And about 10 pounds of one. downward pressure. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. And then bring your pressure up on the last pad. Yeah. All right. right. Eight, and then I'm, just I'm one watching more. your pad rotation. Sometimes I'm not seeing good rotation. So make sure you're holding that really yeah. well. All right. This is that last pass here. All right. Okay. Uh, clean towel. I think you should give extra credit to your students if they can count. Can in I different laugh? languages, each <laughs> pass. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so um, one of the things I was just noticing 
when you were polishing is we've got two planes here. You've got this flat mm -hmm. plane, then you've got part of the unique design, the Cadillac. You've got a plane that comes up here, and you're bringing your pad over from this plane and hitting this right plane. There. Sometimes that pad was stalling, stalling out a little, little bit. There. So there's a black felt marker over there, or um, uh, there's a black Sharpie marker over mm -hmm. there. Go ahead and grab that. And so one of the things I do, and I always teach everybody else to do, is take and mark their backing plate or their pad or both so you can monitor pad rotation. And the reason why is because if the pad, when you're using any kind of free spinning random orbital polisher, if the pad is not rotating, then it's likely not oscillating. oscillating. So, and, and you need both. You need pad rotation mm -hmm. and oscillation to, now watch the words here, to effectively remove paint mm -hmm. at a pace that isn't going to leave you in the garage for a million years trying to buff out a car. Yes. So you need good pad rotation and good pad oscillation. And marking your pad will let your eyes see if that's actually taking place. And if it's not, then you can take and uh, try to do some things to figure out what's going wrong. Maybe you're not holding the tool so the pad is flat to the surface. I mean, there could be a couple different things. Maybe the, uh, the pad is too large. Mm -hmm. The pad you showed me, won't you grab it, that black pad? Grab that pad and, uh, and, and grab, say, the blue one over there and sh show them to Yancey. Look at the difference in pads I'm having you use versus the pad you were using. So you've got a really thick pad that's got a larger sur surface diameter compared to a thinner pad with a smaller diameter. And the smaller pad, at least in, case, in the case of this type of tool, is going to rotate better so you're going to get the job done faster. Okay. okay, throw the light on there and see how it looks. Oh, hold on, let me get in. i got to get the <laughs> reveal. One more time to go to a different color scheme. There you go. All right. Wow. Uh, let's... All right, you guys remember what that looked like before. Now look at it. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so you just pulled out all the heavy holograms because mm -hmm. a, ho a rotary buffer imparts holograms, scratches is what I call them. You could call them swirls, but they're technically it's a scratch pattern inflicted by a rotary buffer. And uh, you, you removed it with a super soft foam finishing pad and a fine cut polish. That's another indicator that this pad is soft. It I mean, it paint. Yeah, I the paint. paint. It, this paint is soft, yeah. Sometimes I mess up my words. It's okay, that's why I'm here. That's why Nancy's here. Okay, so then, uh, and then you countered out, you did eight section passes. Mm -hmm. You know, eight is just a good baseline. Um, you may need to do 10 to 12. Heck, you may need to clean your pad and do a second set of section passes. Yeah over a section of paint if you find it's really hard and you're limited by your tools, pads, and chemicals. Uh, but usually, like three, four, and five, that's not going to be enough to do anything. You need Question to do eight. And for you. Um, eight, wouldn't it be if you're doing more than eight, then that could turn around and show you that you need a little bit more heavier cut? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, but you, but it all starts with having a baseline. So right, eight correct. is just a good standard but baseline. But like if you're sitting there with one, one thing and you're doing 20 passes, <laughs> you could have did it in eight with a, a yeah, different pattern. Exactly, and, and that, right. that circles back to the test spot. Right. Dial right. in a process that works to your expectations at the test spot and then duplicate that over the rest of the car. And assuming the defects are the same depth over the rest of the car, and they should be because as a car owner, you do the same things to the car, which puts the scratches in the same way. Mm -hmm. And assuming the car has not been repainted, so it has the same paint, mm -hmm. Whatever you dial in at the test spot is going to work on the rest of the car. And that's why I tell people um, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with having great lights, you know. And we sell lights. We have lights. Mm -hmm. But if you could pull up that picture of the first test spot, that purple, that was a 19... Purple car? Yeah, that was a 1956... Hold on. I'm getting there. Hold Lincoln on. Premier. There you go, people. Built and owned by Terry Cook called the Titanic. And in 1999... Is that the only picture on this right here, or is there more if I scroll, scroll down? If you scroll down, there may be a few more. In 1999, Terry Cook hired me to fly down to California and wet sand, cut and buff that car. I had no idea where I was going. I, I thought I was going to some really cool shop. I ended up in a parking garage. <laughs> <laughs> and and if, in, in that garage were just a few eight-foot overhead fluorescent lights. That's all the lights I had. But once I dialed in my test spot, you could have blindfolded me because all I had to do is repeat what I was doing in the test spot. And I would have got the same results on the fender that I, over the rest of the car. You know people have been wanting me to do a video of you. We set you up on a test panel and what do you call it? Blindfold, blindfold you. <laughs> yeah. So So... Of course, light's good, but once you dial in the test spot and get the results you want, you could, you wouldn't, it wouldn't matter what kind of light you had because you're going to do the same thing mm. to each section of the car. And that kind of goes back also to what color do you use on the walls of your shop? You know, all that stuff's all good, good but no matter what the color of the walls are, 
after I die on my test spot, I'm gonna continue doing the test spot to the car no matter what color the walls are. And if my test spot came out perfect, the car is gonna come out perfect, except for those two factors that could change if the car's been hit and it's been repainted, yeah. the paint changes, or for some reason, someone put deeper scratches in than what I did on my test. And usually, the horizontal surfaces, so the hood, roof, and trunk, usually have the worst scratches on most cars unless something weird's happened to the sides. Sure. Like, you're in a Jeep and you drive four-wheeling in the the, the branches, the, the tule bushes are scratched on the sides of your car. Okay, so we, we, we figured out what your problem was, and it wasn't really a problem, you just needed another tool, tool. in your arsenal. Yep. So you have a heavy cut. See, it cut. wasn't you. It wasn't you. <laughs> you have a heavy cut and a medium cut, and when you leave here today, you're gonna have a fine cut. Appreciate that. I have okay. one question for you. Yeah. Though. Uh, so, you know, obviously we're using certain tools, but I know you do have the gear driven, is for softer paint. Wheel that, that over be, here. Uh... I thought you might ask that question. <laughs> That wasn't scripted. <laughs> okay, uh, now this is interesting. You know, uh, I always think of myself as a perpetual student. I'm always learning. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the year, but it was a, a few years ago I was asked to buff out this uh, P3 Ferrari. It had single stage red paint on it. Uh, it was stored in a museum for 20 years, and over the course of the 20 years it was completely swirled out. When I went to buff it out, I I did all the initial correction work with the gear driven tool and then I switched over to the Meguiar's G100 which is like the Porter cable and I posted my write up, it's still up on the forum today, I think you can uh, google something like uh, move over Rudolph, I know I had, it was a Christmas, it was a Christmas detail so I said move over Rudolph because it was a red Ferrari, Rudolph had a red nose but if you type something like Rudolph, Christmas, P3 and Mike Phillips it will pull up. But as I went through the process, someone said, hey, Mike, I noticed that you started with the gear-driven tool, mm -hmm. but you finished out with the G100. How come? And I said, because gear-driven tools tend to be more aggressive. That's okay on a hard paint, or say you're buffing out a boat with oxidized gel coat. But when it comes to softer paints, and watch how I word this, because I'm really careful with my words. When it comes to soft paints, a free spinning random orbital polisher will finish out nicer, more consistently than a gear driven tool. So it's not that you can't finish out the gear driven tool, especially if you get a super soft pad and a great sure. fine cut finishing polish, but it's gonna be easier if you got a pad that isn't direct drive, it's got some slip in there as you're buffing it out. And it just, that's something my eyes have noticed over the years I've been detailing cars. I appreciate but that. you are starting a business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so nothing wrong with your um, torque 15x, is mm -hmm. that what they call that? 15 millimeter free spinning yeah. tool. Mm -hmm. But you're gonna find, here's two gear driven tools. This is the Rupes Mille, it's a five millimeter. Can you millimeter. move that one back a little bit? It's a little bit blocked by the front. Like Just that? pulls the, there you go. Okay, this is the Mille, this is a five millimeter gear driven and you can hear the, you can hear the gears when I pulled up to my microphone. This is the, this is the flex, this is eight millimeter. A little more growly there. And my recommendation for you would be, as you can fit it into your budget, mm -hmm. get a gear-driven orbital. And yeah. that way, when you're buffing out a car, and this car's not a really a great example because it actually has a lot of flat panels. Yeah. Okay, but you start getting a car that has a lot of curved panels, mm -hmm. you're just gonna find that a gear-driven tool, because the pad won't stall out, you can, what I like to say is plow through a car a lot faster, get the job done faster. Sure. Plus, you're never doing that second mental work, okay? So running a polisher is one type of work, mm -hmm. physical. Yeah. But anytime you're using a free spinning dual action polisher, you're also looking to see if the pads rotate. So you're mentally, every time you're buffing, you're just sitting there, look, is the pad rotating? Is the pad rotating? Is the pad rotating? And if it's, it, it wears your brain out. And with one of these gear driven tools, you just point where you want it to go and, you know, go. buff. You don't got to mm -hmm. think about it. It's going to get the job done faster. But when you get to softer paints, you got to back up. Well, the thing is, I, I mean, let me let me bring myself up here. If not, I'm just like a voice out of off of frame talking. <laughs> um, there is somebody behind the voice. Uh, just think of this, people. Uh, I know that we're kind of talking about marring and talking about the soft paints and everything like that. But think about it this way: ha you did what four test spots just on that one panel right there. Yep. Yep. Then you did other test spots other places mm -hmm. too. Okay. Now just think of this: if he did that entire car. Each time he did a test spot and he still wasn't happy with the results, think of all the time and product and energy that he wasted. So that would definitely be the reason you did it correctly. I mean, you obviously listened in Mike's class about doing a test spot. So I'm just saying. So let me, let me bring up some what I like to call car wax history. Back in <laughs> 1993, the internet was still brand new. Was it a baby? 
It was just a baby. I, I think someone told me once this, a statistic that America Online only had a half a million users by 1996. You mean AOL. Huh? AOL. AOL. Okay. Yeah, only had a half a million people online in 1996. That's nothing. And I was on the internet writing how to articles for a car detailing that I can back up to 94, but I, I remember it was 1993. A guy came up and he bought a compound and he rubbed it all over his car. And then he came up to the, back then it was called uh, Usenet news, news Groups, uh, Rec Autos MISC. And <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was the hierarchy of the group we were in. And he says, hey, I just did my whole car. And man, it's not looking good, it's looking worse. And that's where I says, wow, you should have done a test spot to one area with this compound you bought instead of buffing out the whole car. And you would have found out at the test spot that that wasn't the right product for that paint. And, uh, but that kind of dates back how far I've been talking and teaching people to do a test spot is 1993. But Yancey's right. Um, if, if you, uh, and I meet so many people all the time, they buff out their entire car, then they stand back and look at it, and maybe it looks good in the garage. They but pull they, it outside. They pull it outside the next day in the sun, because it's dark by the time they're done. Do, if they start in the morning, it's usually dark by the time you're done. They pull it outside and they're looking at it, oh my gosh, this looks horrible. But that's what the test spot does. But that comes back to also having a great light. And all this really starts with great abrasive technology. You know, um, everything for me, if it doesn't make black paint look good, it's not gonna make any paint look good. So test everything if you can on black. You know, you can always go to the wrecking yard or even a body shop and say, hey, if you got an old junker door or trunk lid that you know, you're gonna give the salvage that I could have and go home and practice and yeah. always test your abrasive technology on something black. That'll well, what tell they you. always say is the black paint, it's not a, it's not a, a love, it's a full-time <laughs> job. Yeah, it's not a color, it's a full-time <laughs> job. Okay, so tell you what. Have we answered all your questions on what you're gonna do as far as taking this home and finishing the car? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think I was on the right track, but like you said, I was kind of missing that last little piece of the recipe. And now that I kind of have everything that I need. And you know, and, and, you know Sonax products, that's a good abrasive technology. It's yeah. not cheap. No. So, you know, again, kind of back to, and you're starting out, you do have a budget. You mm -hmm. picked two great products. You just needed, you yeah. had a what they call a hole in your line. You, you had a missing, thing there so uh, we, we hooked up with the fine cut polish basically thank you uh, and uh, before you leave I'm also going to give you some clean pads so I know you got clean pads to finish this car that. out thank you so the next thing you want to do is you want to put a ceramic coating on here yeah. and you've already bought one right mm -hmm. okay so do you remember what it was pinnacle uh, black label wasn't it I think it was yeah. okay okay so tell you what um, before we started this video I had you go ahead and do the whole process that mm -hmm. we did right here to the hood. Yeah. So let's go over. We're gonna. Oh, go we're gonna fly. We're people. gonna go over the steps to correctly install a ceramic coating. Okay. All right. I. You get to fly, people. Fly with me. Oh, fly with me. All right. You guys, all over on that side. That would be awesome. Okay. Where'd Mike go? He disappeared on us, people. <laughs> well, whenever you're working with uh, all this magic voodoo juice, mm -hmm. voodoo juice, it's important to wear gloves. Okay, so uh, the first thing we're gonna do, so this is the hood, and uh, um, I hood. posted some pictures of this and also a video to my Instagram, my Facebook, and uh, to the forum. And what the pictures showed was the horrific swirls back there. And up here, we just had you know light micromarring. It wasn't too bad. Yeah, it wasn't bad at all. It wasn't bad at all, but it wasn't perfect. It, wasn't, it didn't look like this. This looks like a pool of black oil. So you refinish this with the Sonax Nano Polish. And at this point, what we need to do is remove the polishing oils, okay? And so that's so uh, the ceramic coating can make a proper bond. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you bought this is the PBL, this is their prep spray, so that's actually a panel wipe, so you got mm -hmm. the right product there. And this is actually, you know what this is, Yancey? This is the thing we just put on, remember that Shelby GT350? Yes. The, the 2018, the white one? Uh -huh. This is the stuff we just used on that white one. So this is really, I think they say this is a four-year coating. Okay. 9-H hardness, incredible chemical resistance, you know, the hydrophobic properties, high water beating. So you got a good coating and it's gonna make this black paint look beautiful. But the first thing we need to do is strip this. Yeah, now, that's right, he's gonna put you to work. Yeah. <laughs> so I brought over some extra large and uh, these look like large. Let's see if I can get these on my hands. Okay. And uh, my good fr uh, friend, Rennie Doyle, a little shout out to Rennie. I always, you know, I never steal other guys' stuff. If I learn something from someone else, I always make sure I give them credit. And one of the things Rennie taught me that I try to pass on to all the other detailers, especially if you're gonna be doing this, you know, for a career, 
is if it's on your skin, the chemical, if it's on your skin, it's in you. And you are it, a sponge, people. Yeah, so, you know, when you're using chemicals, take, use the appropriate protection equipment, in this case, some uh, nitrile gloves. And, I'm sure um, that sounded really good right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I could have went for an extra large. Uh, that was actually a mistake. <laughs> okay, I've already pre-inspected these, but I'll, uh, but anyway, thanks, Rennie. Uh, just always trying to pay it forward and share this with guys. If you're gonna do this for a career, you're gonna have you're gonna work with a lot of chemicals. Start wearing gloves now. Now I've already pre-inspected these, but I want to show everybody. After you've polished the heck out of this car, this this hood is as perfect as it's gonna get. The last thing you want to do is wipe this with a towel, with the prep wipe, which is a solvent, mm -hmm. and be using a towel that has even just one little contaminant in it. So what I always teach guys to do is look at the towel and then take and inspect it with your hands. And why is that? Because a lot of times your hands will detect a particulate that your eyes cannot see. Makes and if sense. there's just one thing in here that's pokey and sharp, pokey. and you fold this towel and wipe that paint, it, took, it takes hours to buffet a car, it takes seconds to put a scratch in. And the, the reason this is important is because microfiber towels are grabby. They grab the polish off, they grab the panel wipe off, they grab the high spots off. Mm -hmm. they, they grab things, that's why we like them. They take things off better than t-shirts, diapers, cheesecloth, and bath towels. Plus they're not as aggressive, they don't mar the paint. But for that same reason that they're grabby, they become easily contaminated. Embedded. So, um, I always teach guys to inspect their towels, and if you see something like that, what is that? Do you know what that is? No. I don't know what it is. Do I want to rub it over your car's paint? Uh, I hope um, not. Well, what you're saying, it's not my car. <laughs> it's not my car. I'll rub that over your car all day long. But now I will take, and I think that's just like, like a piece of wood fiber or something. And, and I actually uh, practice keeping all my towels clean out here, so it it's always surprises me when I find things that actually are contaminated. So this passes my s inspection. And I've actually already inspected these, but just to do this on camera. Oh, so. you must not have inspected that one good, Dad. Uh, or maybe I just didn't see it. Or just feel for show. It. Okay, so this is nice too. So here's two towels we can start mm -hmm. with that are clean. Awesome. Um, so to do this, uh, take your panel wipe. Yep. And um, let me show you the technique for this. In case you've never done this before. Um, I always show a, a two-pass system for putting a coating on. And the first pass, you want to use this product kind of heavy or wet. That means use an ample amount of product. What you're trying to do is dissolve any of the polishing oils and get them off so the, bond, the coating can make a proper bond. And you start out by just taking and spraying this down. I'll just do a section here. I'll let you do the rest. I'll do the other half. But spray this down, and you want to get it to the point where it's, it's almost running off, but it isn't running off because then it'll be on the floor and you're wasting product. Sure. But that's how you can kind of tell you've got enough product. The see is starting to run yep. right there. I'm getting it in there. Okay. Oh, so, you guys don't have a light back there, do you? We can go get one. So then take your towel, one. and I should have my gloves on, but uh, and also put a little mist on there. You know, it's, mm -hmm. actually easy, yeah, it's actually easier to hold a towel that's lightly damp than a dry towel. My hand doesn't slide off. Spread it around. Come back and wipe this off. And then let me just ask you a question. Assuming I, I did this correctly, where would all the polishing oils be right now? In the towel. On the towel. So would I want to use this, that's those two sides of the towel to wipe another section? No, you would not. I'd just be cross-contaminating. So then think about it. How many towels do you think it takes to chemically strip a car? A whole car? A lot of car, <laughs> a lot of towels. So, and the reason I'm pointing this out is because most guys uh, if you're an enthusiast and you want to coat your own car, great, but make sure you've got enough clean, dedicated towels. And some of the other videos that we've made here, I've shown you how to uh, have a dedicated place to store them or even That's go nice. buy a plastic tote, you know, something mm -hmm. and mark it so your kids, your buddies, nobody's taking your coating towels and using them to wipe fender lips or things like that and <laughs> possibly contaminating them. So. Uh, well, go ahead. That's that's how you that's how wet you want to apply it. And then for the second wipe, because I teach a two wipe. Hand me the uh, product there, the panel wipe. For the second wipe, now instead of putting down a heavy amount, it's just a light mist, and you could actually just put it on the towel. Here you go. Yeah. And what this does is the key word is it ensures you have an oil-free surface. Okay. So then you make your second wipe. 
and that would go real fast because now there's very little product on the surface. Yep. And then what I teach in my classes is if you have a buddy, you use the buddy system. So you go around and do the heavy wipe, and I would come back and do the oh, light wipe. Oh, so you're going to take the easy way. <laughs> well, I could do it. We could reverse that. No, I'm just that. joking. I'm joking. So I'll let you go ahead and start out. All right. Here's some more towels. And this, this, go ahead and uh, let's just do half this hood. I'll follow you. All right. Here, here's your towel. Got it. While you're doing that, I'll glove up. All right, while you guys are doing this, I'm going to go back and see if any of you people out there have some questions that we can nail down real quick. Oh, those fit much better. <laughs> All right. Oh, I like to say, everybody, when you guys are posting where you guys are from, thank you. It kind of gives me a, a, a overlook on where you guys are at. I mean, we have Italy. We have, where else did we have today? Uh... You're all up at the top. Okay, good job. Now, why don't you just go ahead and mist some onto my towel, and then you can jump to the other side and knock out Columbia, that. Columbia. Okay, so he did Ohio, the wet wipe. Canada. I'm going to do this, the first pass. I'm going to do the second pass. He's got a little on there, and I'm just going to come back and just wipe this real soft. And kind of the goal is, is when you're done doing this step, is that paint should look perfect. You want any streaks or any smears because whatever that paint looks like, that's how it's going to look after you put the coating on. Uh, the coatings, because they're they're not water soluble, you know, they have a solvent base, at least most of them. You know, if there's any kind of streak or smear on here left from the panel wipe, it tends not to want to really remove it or remove it easily. So you need that paint to look as perfect as possible after the chemical stripping step or the panel wipe step. Now that little, that last little light wipe, so that's pretty much ensuring that it's uh, totally streak free and everything like that, correct? That's streak kind of free and oil free, or yep. sub substance free, no yep. substances. Because what you get from there is what you're going to get after you get done doing your coating. Okay. I'm going to fold to a clean side and just take, if you would, put a little mist on there for me. Good enough. Okay. Do, 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 do. But yeah, no, uh, we have people tuning in from Dubai. England. <sighs> The only way to coat a car in Dubai would be with air-conditioned garage. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? Uh, what are you using for the panel wipe again? That is the Pinnacle Black Label Panel Wipe. It's, is what yeah, that, Surface Prep. Uh, surface Prep Spray, sorry. There's so many products that we have. It's hard to keep them all straight. And people, I will also be uh, posting up all the links of the products that we used in here. I didn't quite get that list before we went live, so I will put that all up in the description of this video after we're done. So you'll have links and everything where you can go see what these products are and read a little bit more about them. Okay, and then you're doing this section I already did over because you don't trust me. I wasn't sure, so I did <laughs> he, he, he was, he, oh, you saw that? Just he was say, stepping you don't to trust you. Me. He was stepping to okay, you. Okay, then give me a light miss. Just one or two. That's good. Okay. Anyway, the, the big picture is however you want to do this, but the goal is, is to Perfection. gently and you know, carefully wipe this panel down after it's been polished using your favorite panel wipe and make sure that it's completely uh, streak and smudge free and all the oils have been removed. And at this point, you could actually take your swirl finder light and just give it a quick once over, you know. Because, you know, this is your car. I want to make sure you're happy. Boy, that does look good, by the way, compared to how it came in. It's, it came in a lot different, that's yeah. for sure. And that's what you want. You want to show off. And most of the time, if you're going to be showing off your car to a customer, you're going to look at the hood. Yeah. That is the major gloss panel. Okay, so then the next thing we want to do is go ahead and apply the coating. Now, uh, for this, and this is, this is all really, you know, nowadays it's basic. You know, 10 let years let ago, let when coatings... Let me see coating, though, real quick. Well, 10 years ago, when coatings were all brand new, all this stuff was kind of new to everybody but yeah. now this is old school because it's been 10 years ah, come on, come on. i think i think the Where article the i have uh that dates back the oldest for uh, installing a coating is 2011. full article it was with um optimum opticote okay so what we have here this is a microfiber suede patch of cloth mm -hmm. this is a foam block one side is rigid or hard the other side has about a quarter inch of soft compressible foam and this is the side you use and that way it can kind of compress to follow the contour of a panel. Hardly any cars out there have completely 100% flat panels. Everything has at least a well, slight, the Tesla truck. slight curve to it. Yeah, the, the Tesla truck. Well, when you get one down here, we'll use the hard side of the block. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so then uh, the next thing you want to do, you want to hold this. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate first, but then I'll let you take over and I'll wipe off the high spots. See, he's pulling a Tom Sawyer, aren't you? Okay, so then we're going to put a strip of the coating right down the middle. Got it. There you go. And then this is actually a coating that you can tackle a fairly large section. It, uh, the flash time is not too fast. I think it's a little over a minute. I could be wrong. We are in an air-conditioned garage. So then the basic technique is really simple. You're just going to use a cross-hatch pattern. And, you know, I would normally go over this section four times. So this is two. Mm -hmm. Here's three. And there is actually really no magic. That was, was that three or four? This will be four. Okay, that was three. Oh, you weren't counting out loud. <laughs> That's why I count out loud. So here's the fourth time I went over that. And all this is really for, there's a couple of reasons. And that is, um, thank you. That is to make sure that you cover every square millimeter with coating. Yeah. And these coatings are designed to bond instantaneously to the surface. So um, even as I'm talking, it's already, that's, that was used. It's already, that one's used. These are wet. How did we get wet towels on my car? Because you guys put them back where you guys got them from. Oh, okay. Well, here's a I whole bunch of dry towels. We can rewind the video if you really want me to. Instant <laughs> replay. Okay. So, uh, but it bonds instantaneously, so that's why you can come in and then just use a s soft, overlapping motion and gently wipe off any of the high spots or the excess residue and uh, then give it a final buff and at this point here grab your swirl finder light you want to make sure that there are no high spots and this is where the handheld light comes in handy because mm -hmm. when this coating if it completely dries like you come out here the next day and this coating's on there it's you're not gonna there. be able to wipe it off yeah and and in this case this coating won't dissolve itself you will have to either polish or compound it off now that wouldn't be so bad if you just had one little spot on the hood yeah but but what if it had them all around the car because you missed them because you didn't have a light? So if you're going to get into coatings, get a great handheld light. Tell you what, I did that section. Mm -hmm. I'll let you go ahead and do the rest of the car, and I'll just kind of follow you. So he told you he was going to get you in our Tom Sawyer. Did we have any questions? Yes, I, I was. You guys started doing that. You guys can do go ahead. What, do that, and I'll go back to the. Where I would start at the, and just for what it's worth, usually when you're coating a car, kind of like when you're buffing. For me, I would start in the center at the highest point, mm -hmm. so back by the windshield, and work my way out. Okay. All right. I am back. They are coating. Let's see here. Is that the new black edition coating? That is, right? No, that's Blackfire. We no, that was Blackfire. Sold out. <laughs> we, which we're sold out. Yes. We I'm have sorry. a sample bottle, and that's it. This is actually the PBL uh, Pinnacle Black Label uh, Pro coating. It's a, it's a four-year coating. But you know, you know why? Just, you know, just let me touch on that since I brought it up. How long anything lasts kind of depends on how you touch it. If we coat this car and it states it's good for four years, we close the garage door and don't come back for 10 years, now it's a 10-year coating. You know, if <laughs> we run it through the, the mechanical car wash down the road, the swirl matic it might be a, a four-week coating. So it just depends on how you're touching it. Okay, I'm going to go through a couple of these little things. Um, Renardo, once again, thank you for my little laser light. Um, what type of weave of towel are you using for the panel wipe and the coating removal? What towel is that that you're using? These are just a flat weave, a simple flat weave towel. Uh, this one's called the Cobra Gray. Um, I show a, a forest green one I use for a lot of things, and it's they're just simple towels. They're not even expensive. And um, I like them because they, they just don't get contaminated easily like a fluffy towel. A fluffy towel. All right, um, let's see here. Dun, 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 which cost my volunteer. Da, da, da. He has a longer name for that. Dual, flex dual action polisher. Fantastic. Ask Mike what his scientific name of the 3401 is. Orbital something something. <laughs> the, 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 the part number is the XC 3401 VRG. Which nobody's gonna call the thirty the beast the XC thirty four zero one VRG, but it's called the beast. And I don't know what the mil I forget what mille stands for. It stands for mille. And of course, Makita named their their gear driven tool the PO five thousand C, which I'm probably the only one that ever actually calls it by its name. Could the PO five thousand C. Here's a tip for all you tool companies. Give your tools cool names, especially if you <laughs> want them to become popular and sell a lot. 
it, it helps. Okay, Rick Hasmeyer. I think I, I think I brewed your name. I'm so sorry, Rick, if I like totally ruin your name every time. Would you say that newer cars generally have softer clear and less of a less of it due to the cost of the savings of the EPA pollution standards? No, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't make any generalization like that at all. I would do a test spot. And I, I would say that um, if I had to hedge my bets, I would say car manufacturers are always trying to reduce co costs and increase profits. So if for that reason, if they could find a way to put less paint on a car, they would do it. Uh, the problem they run into is uh, con the customer satisfaction index, the CSI. And um, you, you cannot mass produce cars only to have customers bringing them back to the dealership because the paint's failing, you know, six months or a year or even two years after they purchased the car. So um, the, a, a car's finish has to have a certain amount of material on it to simply hold up over time. Too thin, like whisper thin clear coats just wouldn't hold up. There's just not enough substance to them. So, uh, you know, I, th I think car companies, you know, and I, I have friends that actually have worked at the OEM level. I never have. Uh, they would uh, be able to speak to this better than me. So if they can save money, of course they're going to. But at the same point, they have to balance that with not having hordes of people wanting their money back because the paint, you know, got clear coat failure one year after owning it. So they got to put a certain amount on there just to avoid the headaches. But the paint hardness uh, and softness, um, I think that's a, an unknown variable. And the, you'll, there, we'll never be able to say, yes, all new cars have soft paint or all new cars have hard paint or somewhere in the sweet spot in the middle. You've got to learn how to do a test spot. Okay, one more question. Uh, well, we have a few more questions, but we'll ask another question, then we'll let you discuss some more things over there. Uh, ben Trahin, I think I said your last name correctly. Mike, what's your favorite way to remove a high spot after the coating has dried for some time? Well, wow, that's a loaded question right there. Uh, I, I don't have a favorite way. In fact, I, I don't ever want to do that again. Um, I have come down here after classes that we've coated cars and inspected. And, you know, and you got 15, 20 people coating, you know, two, usually two cool cars down here in a class. It is, it is normal to find some high spots. It just happens, you know. Uh, my big classes, we, we usually turn out, we go through anywhere from 12 to 15 cars in three days. They're all hands-on. They're all on your feet. You've been through it. It's all yeah. hands-on. It's a lot of work. And why don't you, uh, while we're there, why don't you tell these people out here, because I have mm -hmm. a lot of people asking about the classes, what is it like? What did, what did you experience and what did you get out of Mike's class? I learned a ton. Uh, you know, I think the main thing that really stuck out was you get to use all the machines. So, you know, I had the one from before, before I took his class, but I got the PX80, like a little, there's a mini one, they have the iBirds, a bunch of different type of tools that, I mean, unless you're in a shop already, how are you going to get your hands on all these different type of tools? So it's nice to see what works best for you, and then, you know, when you're ready to make your purchases, you're ready to do it. So it had the foundation for everything, using the different tools, it was fun, it was a lot of work, but you know, that's what you sign up for. You don't sign up to sit in a chair and sit at a... That was my next question for <laughs> you. Like, Look at the wall. How much did yeah. you actually sit during the class? Not very often. And then when you were, it was like, all right, let's go. Let's, let's do it. What, so, what, what year did you come? What year was that? I think it was last year. Last year, I mean, remind was it... Uh, uh, September... The September class. I teach it three times a year. So January, May, and September. I think it was September. The September was class. The last three days. Is that the class. one we had the Lamborghini? The Lamborghini. The green Lamborghini yeah. that was all swirled out. Yeah. I yeah. worked on that one personally. It was yeah. nice. Yeah, that was a fun class. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that class, I think we went through, I don't know, um, we went through 13, 14 cars. Mm -hmm. And also for the wet sanding portion, instead of sanding hoods, which, you know, it's easy to stand here, sand a hood and buff it out. Yeah. We sanded the down truck. real cars. Yeah. One of them was a 1953. Ford F100 street rod truck. That's cool. Yeah, so uh, luckily for me, I have really good relationships with all the <laughs> car guys, and here's what they know is they know if they've got a car coming out of the body shop with a fresh paint job, that they'll get a better wet sand cut and buff down here because we use all the best stuff versus the shop they had it painted because they don't tend to use things like 3M Trizac sanding yeah. discs, you know, or nickel well, finishing free? papers. <laughs> you know, and they also don't finish them out with orbitals. They kind of cut them. They just, it's called slop and glop. They just cut them and swirl them and yeah. give them back to the owner. So I usually have really cool cars for wet sanding. And I'll tell you, there's a huge difference as far as learning the whole experience mm -hmm. of sanding a spot on a hood versus having to deal with 
fender lines, headlights, door handles, mirrors, trim. I mean, yeah, everything on a car that you would have windows. to sand around and then mm -hmm. find out how to buff around. Yeah. And one of the things I teach people is you don't sand where you can't get your buffer or how are you going to get your sanding marks yeah. out. So there's some wet sanding you had to do in here that from your class. I was like, I felt comfortable doing it. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're like, uh. I, I think most people after they take my wet sanding classes, they kind of learn in most cases they don't do it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Okay, that was fun. Next. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's a lot of risk mm -hmm. with very little reward. And I tell you, you know, the topic of wet sanding is so popular. But th this, you know, this car here, in fact, if you want to run up there and grab my paint thickness gauge. Mm -hmm. uh, the oh, here, I'll get it. I'll get it. The, the factory finish on a car is around two mils. You know, a post-it note is about three mils. So the factory finish is thinner than a post-it note. So most people shouldn't be sanding, fact, you know, cars of the factory paint. In fact, in the industry, most wet sanding is done on either collision repair, so you wreck your Honda, you get the fender repainted, and now there's too much orange peel or they want to match orange peel, so they'll sand that fender, not the whole car, or custom paint jobs. That would be Jim. Remember our buddy Jim? We always have a Jim. <laughs> Jim, Jim, uh, Jim's, Jim in high school had a 67 Chevelle. Now that he's older and retired, he bought his dream car. He spent five years tearing it apart, putting it back together. Now he's to the point where it's going to the custom paint shop. Mm -hmm. It's getting the custom paint job. When it comes out, now he's going to wet sand the entire car because yeah. the painter put more paint on the car. And so, he's bored. He's retired. Yeah. So this is a paint thickness gauge. All right, hold on. Let me zoom in there. And um, flip it around so I'm going to step over here so mm -hmm. you can see this. My, my hand's kind of sweaty, so I want to smudge your brand new paint job. <laughs> We're measuring at 4.8 uh, on the hood of this car. When I did that over there, it was 4.6. So to me, this is on the thin side. Usually if on a factory finish, I want to see somewhere between 6 and 8 mils. But this measures total film built, so it doesn't really tell me anything. That could still have 2 mils of clear and you know 1 mil of primer and 1.8 mils of base coat. You just don't ever know, but that's why if we go back to the beginning of this video, we always use Test buds. the least aggressive <laughs> process to get the job done. So we leave the most paint on the car so it'll hold up over the service life of the car. So you get just as much beauty out of the car as you do mechanical service. Think you could say that all again? Quicker? I could say it all again. I've done it a few times. <laughs> but a paint thickness gauge, um, I always teach people in my class, this is what I call a go or no-go tool. It's going to help you make that decision whether to take a compound or maybe lightly polish or maybe you don't touch it at all. So I call it the go or no-go decision. It helps you to make that decision. It's also good for marketing. You know, if, uh, if you're talking to a potential customer and you can pull out your handy dandy paint thickness gauge, that might impress them. At least it'll show them you kind of know something about your craft. If he decides not to go with you, anybody else he goes to that doesn't have one, he's going to be like, don't you got a paint thickness gauge? I know. So, you know, to me, it's, part, it's just, just as important for a marketing tool as it is to keep you from getting into danger by doing aggressive things to paint that could be potentially very thin. You can put that over there if you want to. Well, we're done except for that smudge I left there. But again, this ain't my car. It ain't your car. You want to get well, that is there, I got Anthony, one. Anthony, is there any okay. uh, oh, more sorry. questions that you have for Mike while you have him here? There's one and there's one. Um, as far as questions go, I mean, we've done kind of done a lot here together. That's a, that's a good smudge, <laughs> ain't it? Um, What's he, in my skin? He has answered pretty much everything, you know, on camera, off camera, you know, everywhere. Uh, I think for me, it was more just the expectations of, you know, you know, of course, I want to get it perfect, perfect, perfect. But, you know, I think it looks great now. It looks awesome. It's more about just getting to know exactly your, what you're going to do with your test spots. You know, like you said, your standard for all your cars, and then you can go off of that. Um, I'm starting to really pick up exactly where I need to be for that. So he's answered kind of everything. And one thing I would point out when we were talking, he wasn't taking his polisher to the max speed. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have to do that with every tool. Um, I do tend to do it with most tools, not all tools. <laughs> this guy's on mic. Um, <laughs> but, but, but usually I'm trying to get done fast. And I, sure. how, I describe, how I say it is I say there's something to be said for speed. You know, if you want to get done faster, there's something to be said for speed by your tool up. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to be slinging stuff everywhere. Uh, but he's using a, a 15 millimeter random orbital polisher. Mm -hmm. And when I was up here uh, testing that tool out on this hood, I found that I was getting the best correction if I did bring the speed all the way up. Yeah. And I pressed down on the head of that tool just a little bit to cause the abrasives to bite into the finish and take little chunks out. That's how you level the surface. Mm -hmm. So, All right, why don't you guys move back up to the back here, and what do you call it? That way I can get on the computer and look to see if we have any questions. 
Plus, I want to show off the entire car now that it's all shiny. <laughs> and now you're going to have to go right in the rain. Here, go ahead and be on this side so that way you're on camera. Or you can be over there where Mike's at. It doesn't matter. It don't matter. You got the... Watch you your cord, though, there, Mike. Yeah. Um, so that way you don't trip and fall. Okay, I am diving in to your guys' questions here. Uh, let's catch up to where we're at. Uh, Omar, we, we did answer about the questions uh, about the classes. We're not doing any classes traveling right now. We are doing a September class. What's the date on that, Mike? Uh, it's the last weekend of September. All right, the last weekend of September. It's always the last oh. weekend of September. All right, well, so. uh, but you can go to autogeek.net and you can click on the little icon detailing classes and get a little bit more information about that. But due to what's happening in the world right now, we are not doing any traveling shows. We are staying home and we do have precautions for the classes that when you guys do come down here. Um, if you miss a high spot, how aggressive probably be? Oh, hey, good question, Renardo. I like that. Renardo Wilson, if you missed a high spot, how aggressive a product would it take to level it down or, or to recost it? Uh, say that again. If you missed a high spot, how aggressive a product would you need to fix it? Uh, it depends on the coating. You know, some coatings will probably come off a little easier than others. Uh, recently, that one that we just launched, um, I would say it was kind of like super glue. I had to, uh, I got Black some on the- Blackfire one? Yeah, the new Blackfire. I, I, I somehow got a smudge on the windshield of that C8 and I didn't know it. And when I came back in uh, the next day, I had to use a compound. I used a compound by hand and just rubbed it off. But I tried to polish first and I couldn't get it off. It was, it was on there. Okay, uh, let's go to Francisco Vargas. I know how to say your name. Uh, with clear coat being as thin as a wrapper from a deck of cards, how many polishes can a life of a car get? A lot of people say, always ask to get a polish and a trike came into replying it's safer not to and and a spray wax will be just fine but people are so attracted to the word polish or buff yeah did you not hear the question i, know. <laughs> I, was, looking, I was looking for my he, question Vargas, he was not paying attention <laughs> i was to looking you. for the the section of my book on hard paint soft paint i couldn't uh, find it okay no with the clear coat being as thin as you know thin as you say it is how many polishes can a, a typical car go through oh uh, good question um here's something i can He's tell you from so experience bad. uh i i had a gm uh, chevy truck hood down here factory finished never nothing ever been done and I actually made a, t uh, a grid out of painter's tape using uh, some, uh, they're actually um, uh, some me uh, flat measuring sticks. So I made this grid that I could pick up and put back on, pick up and put back on, on onto a hood. And then I had X's on these pieces of tape running back and forth. So I could put it back on the same place of the hood every single time and take a measurement. And then here's what I did. I hand sanded 200 strokes per section, the hood with 2000 grit and then I compounded it and polished it. And each part of the, each step on about 10 different places on the hood, I took measurements, I logged it all down. There's the article is still on the forum today. And I took off 0.4 to 0.5 mils. So that was wet sanding with 2000 grit, compounding wool pad rotary, machine polishing DA, medium cut polish, and then measuring. That's a lot of work, and I only took off 0.4 to 0.5 mils. So if you're, if you're not sanding, and you're just buffing, and you're using quality products, I would say um, how much material you're taking off would be the least of your worries. But what you should really be doing is think about this, is after you get that car polished out, don't do things that put scratches <laughs> back in to make you have to get aggressive again. You know, this is a hypothetical question that everybody likes to ask, and it's a great question, but what they leave out is the idea of not doing dumb things again. Don't do stupid yeah. stuff. So correct it, teach your customers how to wash it carefully. If you have a maintenance program, offer to wash it for them. Tell them not to take it to swirl them at car washes. Oh, come on, take all the fun out of and, it. And don't put the scratches back in so you don't have to do that aggressive compounding step again. The most you should have to do is you know, a medium or a fine cut polishing job. So mm. good question though. Okay, uh, let's go right here. Uh, Michael O'Neill. Mike, talk about SRC clear coat. SRC clear coats. Um, SRC clear coats. Uh, jog my memory. What does the SRC stand for? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I know what it stands for, I just can't think of it. Uh, they're typically harder clear coats. Uh, harder clear coats, the benefit would be is they'll resist uh, degradation, whether it's through corrosion, swirls or scratches, so they'll hold up longer. Things that are harder, like diamond, will hold up longer exposed to the elements than say, um, you know, a sponge, which would be really soft. Kind of a weird analogy there. <laughs> yeah, um, you kind of went yeah, off the cliff on that but, one. Uh, okay, a radish, okay, a diamond will last longer. You know, I don't know, it's a tomato. A radish, you went from a sponge <laughs> to a radish. Something soft to something hard. Are you hungry? Uh, so they tend to last longer just because they're simply, they're harder. Uh, but when it comes to repairing them, you need a more aggressive compound or a more aggressive pad or a more aggressive tool or a combination scratch of all three. Scratch resistant clear yeah, coat. Yeah, there's scratch resistant clear coat. Thank you. Yeah, I remember we used to market the uh, Blackfire compound and polishes specifically formulated for SRC paints. So I, I, I knew that. that. I just, you know, sometimes you can't draw everything out of the old memory bank. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of but, stuff uh, in there. You know, a good question, but here, here's, come back down to what everything starts out when it comes to the paint side, which is what all detailers really like to do. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a few guys like to clean interiors, but most of us like to do paint polishing. You need great abrasive technology. I, I tell you this, uh, Oops, I don't care. I'm not trying to do a plug, but this is something that just Too came late. out from <laughs> Sonax, the Ultimate Cut 6 Plus. Oh, here, let me. This is an aggressive compound that would be great for SRC compounds. Uh, yeah, I just about tripped over something I'm always showing people. <laughs> yeah, it's your bucket. There it is. There's the new stuff. Yeah. Uh, this here, is the. Uh, before you fall over that cord, let me have it. This is the clean, dirty towel bucket. And um, I cleaned this before we started today. And as we use towels, I put it in here. Now, someone the other day ago said, well, Mike, uh, I don't have a bucket like that, but all I got is a laundry bin. Well, I've got a laundry bin too. It's out there by the wash machine. What I like about this though, is once I fill this up, it's about the right size for a medium to large load in the washer. And I take it right to the washer, dump it out, wash it, dry it, bring it out here, inspect it, fold it, put it away. So there's nothing wrong with however you want to store your towels as long as you base the, the bucket or the container stays clean. So when you put your dirty towel in there, it it stays clean because it isn't on the floor where the sticks and leaves and the dirt are. You've got to have a system in place to keep your towels from becoming contaminated. He's really happy and proud of his dirt, clean, dirty towel bucket. It has made its debut in every hey, video so far. It's part of my detailing arsenal. Uh, no, it's, it's a good tip. It's a really good tip. Okay, here's another really good one. Renardo's asking some good questions today. Uh, hold on. Uh, what's the lowest mills you would go before you say, no, I'm not puffing this car? Uh, if anybody has ever seen uh, the BMW, it's actually the black car that Meguiar's used on the bottle of Swirl X. Okay, it showed a black car, taped down the middle, one half was flawless, one half had swirls, I buffed out that car. And when I did a paint thickness gauge measurement on the roof, it was in the three range, and I would not compound the, uh, the, the, the roof on that BMW. I used a medium or a light polish, and that's as far as I would go. Back when I did that, that would be the year 2002 or 2003, I think, and we didn't have all the cool things that we have out nowadays. But, but to me, that was thin paint. That was really thin. It was in the like 3.4, 3.5. There's probably some pictures still on the internet. But anything, anytime I get to the four and below, I don't want to be getting aggressive. You know, again, the paint thickness gauges that we use that can afford that are practical, keyword practical, um, they measure total film build. And so what I want to try to do is I want to find out, is that car brand new or has it been buffed out by 20 guys before I got to it? See, the difference there is, is I don't know how much clear they've already buffed off. If it's brand new, no one's touched it, and I, I see a measurement of four, I still don't want to get very aggressive because it could have two mils, but there's no way for me to know. And anybody that thinks, you know, there's these paint thickness gauges that you can buy that measures total film build. But what I always teach people is, look, you want to buff out the car or you want to spend all day long measuring and then plotting and looking at a computer program. At some point, you've got to go into the garage and buff Sometimes out the car. Sometimes you got to work. And just use common sense. Use the least aggressive product to get the job done. But actually, all this starts with whenever you're working on someone's car is making sure you're matching the right package to, to their car and to their needs. But you, you know, were talking, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yeah. hijack that. Because that's the one thing that you were saying, Anthony, yeah. that you needed to learn, Arn, is how to adjust his expectations. So that way, what do you call it? He wants it to be totally perfect, but you know, somebody's paying for a daily driver one step. Sure. You, I mean, I know, like, you know, okay, we're doing the ones that we're doing this. This was, I was trying to get it that, you know, perfect, perfect finish where you're going to go to a car show, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's been through a lot, and I know all that, but I'm definitely starting to work on what you can do with your budget, what time, you know, all that kind of stuff. You don't want to work for free. So no, you've got to make sure you match, you know, whatever you're getting paid for, your package, that's what you're getting paid for, to the right car, to the right person. Some people 
someone may own a, uh, a, a mundane daily driver, mm -hmm. you know, you just do a one step, you just use a one step cleaner wax or an AIO on that, but then they bring you their Corvette. Now you do package two or package three, you do more to it because they're willing to pay more because it's their toy. Sure. So you, but anyway, knowing how thick the paint is is kind of something, it's important to know, but also you have to, in context, also remember just what you're doing. All right, got another question. Um, Francisco Vargas, Vargas. What advice can you give guys without a shop during the winter? I feel like it will be a scheduling battle against weather. Are you talking about like working, Francisco? If you can really quick, hit me up in the comments because I'm kind of confused about your question. Well if, well, if you're if you're a mobile detailer working in the winter in a cold environment, I've done that. I I, I did some mobile detailing in Seattle, Washington. Oh, when it wasn't raining three days out of the year. <laughs> it was actually I was doing an Audi Quattro and it was snowing outside. And uh, I was in the driveway and it started to snow. And so what I did is I finished up real quickly. <laughs> but the first thing I did is I started early because the, the, the forecast wasn't, you know, for rain. So, you know, snow's kind of this drive. But start early? I don't know. That's a tough one. If you're mobile detailing in this wintertime, that's going to be a tough gig to do anything outside. Okay. So. Um... I think I went through all the questions. But, but let, let me just tell you, you know, one of the things I always do when I did mobile detailing is I let the customer know I need their garage. You hey, know? there's a, don't be afraid to ask. I, I meet so many detailers that don't want to use their customer's water, don't want to use their customer's electricity or their garage. I always used all of them. That was an expectation. Hey, Jim, I'm showing up <laughs> at your house. You know, move the car out of the garage. You know, maybe this weekend go out and you look at most people's garages full of boxes. You know, the car's outside because there's no room in the garage because of all the stuff they have. Clean out the garage. Then I go sweep it. And I talk about this actually in my book. Um, when you go to detail a car, you need a clean work area. And if you're doing mobile detailing, you may have to clean their workbench off so you have a clean place to put your yep. towels. You know, you can't assume that workbench is clean, but I also clean their, their, uh, their sweep out their garage floor. I'm, at some point, if they don't have a lift, I'm gonna be setting my butt down on the ground to look across from the lower panels to buff them out. And I don't wanna sit down at a bunch of dirt, so I sweep out their garage, but I actually cover that in my book. But you, you know, as you're gonna do mobile detailing winter, be using your customer's garage. Problem solved. Hey, Jim. I'm gonna <laughs> borrow everything that you have. It was never a problem for me, and I did this for a long time. For a long time. Um, we wrapping up? We are wrapping up, because you don't have anything else to say, right? Uh, no, I was gonna show that one gentleman had a Paul's paint by. Oh hey, shoot, I'm... we're not wrapping up. Yeah. So Forget, I was ever there. <laughs> I totally forgot. I don't even have it down as a note. Let me just show you real quick. All right, we have a gentleman, and do you remember the guy's name, Mike? Uh, no, I don't, but he's a forum member. And he's we have a, a forum member that is of the elderly persuasion. He's 75 years old. 75 it, years young. 75 yeah. years young. And he wants to hand polish his car before he puts a coating on. He doesn't have a polisher. So I That's said right. I would show him how to hand apply a polish, the technique. And it's real simple, but just in case you didn't know, you want to start with a clean applicator pad. In this case, it's just your basic yellow wax applicator pad. I'm using a light cut. Whoop. No, wrong product. <laughs> I'm using a very raw. Really, <laughs> really aggressive <laughs> compound. Here is a fine cut polish. This is what we use to fix this. And I'm going to put some product on here. You want to hold this? Hold on, let, me, gotcha. let me, show me how much you have on I there. put a, a good quarter, a dollop, you know. That's a dollop. A, a dollop. I don't like that word, but that's what it is, a dollop of product. And you notice I didn't put it in the middle, really. I put it kind of on the edge because my fingers are on this side. Now, here's how you hand apply a polish. Take, using an overlapping motion, use this to spread the product out. And for him, he says his car's in good shape. He just wants to make sure any previously applied wax or any glossing agents from quick detailers or car washes are removed so the coating will stick. Okay, so after you spread it out, then normally what I would do is just repeat this process, you know, and I'm kind of putting this on. If I had dry skin, I was putting some lotion on because my skin was weathered from being out in the sun too long. But I'm just thoroughly just applying this. And what this is doing, if there was some carnauba wax on there or a synthetic sealant, or you know, I washed my car with the product that says it's a wash and wax, maybe I've washed it for the last 10 years with wash and wax, you can assume there's a heavy buildup. Yeah. Then after you do a section, and notice the section I tackled is about the size of a microfiber towel. I think you've did this once before. <laughs> then just take your towel, remember you're gonna inspect it, and then come back and just gently wipe that off. And that's all you gotta do to, by hand, use a polish to strip off old wax, uh, any road film, uh, anything else that could be on the surface that would keep that 
coating from bonding. And then when I move to the new section, okay, so I did, I did this section. Now I'm going to keep moving across the trunk. I'm going to do this section. And you're going to overlap a little bit. Correct? I'm just going to overlap a little bit. So again, back here to my product. And hey, you know what, Anthony? I think this is a good time to end the video. Let's just go ahead and walk off and we'll just leave Mike right there where he's doing that. Okay, so I overlap a little bit into the previous section and then just repeat this. And this is a good reason, or this is, a, this is why a lot of people buy polishers. It's because this is a lot of work to do this to the entire car. I'm happy to show you on the trunk lid of a Cadillac, <laughs> but I wouldn't want to do an entire car. I can't even remember the last time I hand rubbed an entire car. Hand rubbed I've, I've done it. Uh, well, actually, uh, that 1937 Packard, yeah. I hand rubbed it three times, times with number, number seven. seven. And uh, that was a heck of a good workout. <laughs> and, and here's point. a little technique. Let me show this to this gentleman watching. All right, let me Take your in. towel, fold it four ways. Okay, now look at your thumb and your finger like it's a clamp and grab the edges and clamp it. Put your towel down and what you're going to do is you're going to spread your fingers out and kind of scrunch the towel up into your fingers and then you've got great control over your towel. This will make little tiny circles. And when you take a little tiny bit off at one time, the towel is able to overcome the, the surface tension between the polish and the paint so you can get it off. If I try to take a big wipe, the towel stays there, my hand goes flying away. So just take little bits off at a time and any product is easy to wipe off. That's what I always loved when I come out in the classes and take pictures and stuff, watch the newbies out there and they turn around, all right, I got my compound on there. Shroom, hand goes across the hood, yeah. rag stays right where they put it down. And then after you get to this point and you do the whole car, then that's when you'd chemically strip it and then put the coating on. Mm -hmm. All right. See, I really wish you'd remember that guy's name. <laughs> we could give him a shout out. I just can't remember. Do you remember his form name? No, not at all. So. Oh, Weekend Warrior. There you go, Weekend Warrior. That was for you, direct from him. Hope you enjoyed you, the video. I think you should, like, we should just go ahead and leave, and he can, <laughs> I'll leave the camera going, <laughs> and you can continue demoing, and we can find out exactly how long oh, it takes you to do that. that's funny. <laughs> no? No? no. Um, once again, I'd like to say thank you to Anthony coming down from Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, not Australia, Melbourne, Florida. <laughs> if not, he's it's got a submarine. <laughs> um, but awesome car. Thank you for letting oh, us yeah. demo on this and I hope that we helped you. Definitely. Or actually he helped you. I didn't anything. I just was over there pushing buttons. Definitely helped me. I appreciate it very much. We're going to let you take that home. Awesome. You Thank got the you. right product for this soft paint. Yes. Now you feel like you're able to tackle this. And yeah. I mean, now I, if it comes up again, you'll know exactly what to do. hundred percent. I was close there. Like I said, I did some other vehicles where it worked out great. It was just this paint was a little softer than I've done before, and I was just missing that ingredient. Right well, there. and the good news is because you got those other two Sonics products, you've actually you've got an aggressive cut, a medium mm -hmm. cut, and a fine cut. So, so no matter whatever them. pulls in your driveway, That's right. you have the product to test and then use. I appreciate that. All right, now question for you: Do we know what we're doing next week? Uh, there is a Corvette sitting outside. It's called a oh the Alcantara, a Carbon 65. Wait, wait until you see what we do to this vet. Yeah, we're going to go over Alcantara cleaning, and you wait till you see what we do to the Alcantara. <laughs> yeah, um, Rob and Dimitri well, showed, I, you, showed you yeah, that. Yeah, this is something Demetrius at Sonex uh, showed me at my class up at the Indianapolis racetrack a few years ago on a Recaro Alcantara seat. And when he started doing this, I was going, oh my gosh, look what he's doing to that chair. And then he fixed it 100%. Yeah, so, so we're going to do that. We're going to, oh, he's going to do it. I'm going to film it. And if it, it doesn't work... It's your problem. It's, it's not, not your my car. car. <laughs> it's not his not car. Is he getting a theme here that we're doing? So tune in next week for that. Um, I do appreciate every one of you. Mike appreciates. Anthony Thank made his debut. You. Thank you again Thank for tuning you. in. And if you live locally in the area and you have a project, hit Mike up, hit me up, and you never know. You might be in Anthony's shoes right there. Um, was painless, right? We didn't yeah. like poke and prod you too much. No, it was you know, fun. We, it was uh, definitely learning a lot. So. And you're comfortable now about comfortable. doing what you what you want to do. Exactly. And the hood's done. The hood's and the, done. And the hood's done. You just got <laughs> less work. You just got a lot more to do. Okay. okay. Um, so thank you very much for tuning in. This will be posted up right here for a replay, also on YouTube. If you haven't, like us on Facebook, hit subscribe, hit the bell, get notified, and until next week, what do we say, Mike? Same time, same channel. Same three p three p.m. Eastern time. Yeah. For for what? Live detailing classes. All right. Thank you, guys. Peace.